Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to our cardiovascular imaging conference. Today the topic is myocardial viability and you will have the opportunity to experience three speakers. So whatever you need to know about myocardial viability. Uh, I think this is a clinically relevant topic and imaging is crucial in it. Uh, so whenever we look at individuals with heart failure, and this is here we're talking about individuals with heart failure and ischemic heart disease. This is the question. We're not talking about cardiomyopathies of non-ischemic etiology. A field that has grown over the past 30 plus years from an initial observation from Dr. Rahim Tula, uh, that after bypass surgery, although individuals have what looks like a chronic situation of heart failure, that a heart may actually improve in function, significantly improve in function to uh, have the ejection fraction back to normal, as well as the symptoms of heart failure abate. To tell you the truth, before that time, the issue of viability was not much on the radar screen. Most people felt that, you know, if you had an infarction or if you had an event, an ischemic event, that not much recovery of function occurs. So within the past 30, you know, 5, 30, 6 years, a lot of investigations have occurred. I think they're pretty much abated nowadays, but I think we were in the midst of quite a bit of these myocardial viability investigations and where do they, where do they fall so that this is today's topic is uh, we'd like to review with you where we stand regarding this issue. And uh, you know, investigations have spanned pretty much everything in cardiovascular medicine to try to identify this because interestingly enough, Although an EKG is, is important in this situation, it may not tell you the whole story. You may have QVAs on the electrocardiogram and yet you have quite a bit of viability. Uh, the, other, the converse is not true, meaning if you have, and I'll show you data, if you have a normal electrocardiogram, actually your specificity for myocardial viability in an individual with heart failure and ischemic heart disease is quite high. So people have looked at echocardiography, contrast echo, diastolic function, PET, nuclear, rest redistribution, thallium, various nuclear techniques, CT, MRI, and uh, you'll have a flavor of them today. Um, I know the field has moved gradually into cardiac MRI, particularly one that it is the only technology that can image a scar as opposed to infer a scar and non-viability. So I think that's one of the major advantages. And it can quantitate it, and as Dr. Shaw will share with you, has quite a bit of impressive data. It's not an all or non phenomenon. Uh, but at the same time, you don't have to go through stress testing. Although stress testing by itself tells us something about viability. If you have ischemia in somebody who has a heart failure, cardiomyopathy-like, just ischemia alone, repetitive ischemia, is part of the pathophysiology or pathogenesis, if you will, of the heart failure in this because the, the concept of stunning came after that of hibernation and we know that probably one of the pathophysiologic mechanisms is actually you have repetitive stunning on a myocardium because most of your physiology you know, evaluation are at rest and you know what happens in a physiologic situation. You'll have repetitive ischemia and conceivably that could be it. So from a Pathology point of view, if you look at these hearts, and we were involved in quite a few of these biopsies in the, in, in the uh, uh, bypass arena, so we have, we and others have a lot of pathophysiologic correlates. If you look at the pathology of these individuals with heart failure and ischemic heart disease, you have a range from almost no scar to a vast majority of scar. And I think this is the challenge in clinical medicine is uh, which ones are they in somebody who has a substrate of heart failure, be it regional or global dysfunction, right? Are we talking about the majority of viability or a few islets of, of fibrosis and replacement scar or a predominantly replaced scar with a little uh, strip of subepicardial still viable area that may not contract? 
Another thing for you to remember is that there is a certain threshold phenomenon of contractility. So any of the methodologies that look at contraction of the heart as opposed to perfusion of the heart, it is said that if you have about a third to half, but at least a third of the subendocardial area that is infarcted and non-functional, you may not detect thickening of that myocardium. So there is a certain threshold phenomenon, although you may still have viable areas around it, that uh, you know, once you have a certain scar in the subendocardial area, you may not be able to detect thickening by echocardiography or even MRI others. So I think this, this is important to keep in mind. So, so what are some of the goals? Well, some of the goals of viability assessment, probably the most important one is the last one, really. I mean. The others is, yes, you'd like to identify patients who benefit from revascularization. You want to predict that this, you know, improve, I mean, this improvement in function will occur after you do an intervention. But as you know, and as things evolved, it used to be a question, should we send the person to a bypass surgery? But then PCI came on board, PCI was stenting, multiple vessels stenting, so it becomes lesser of an issue in an individual, even who has maybe multi-vessel disease, has bad heart failure. But ultimately, the big question is, if I have somebody in stage three or even four heart failure, has coronary disease, you know, should we have attempt at revascularization even with minimally invasive or off-pump bi off bypass, or maybe better send than individual for either a destination therapy with a VAD or transplantation. So th these are the big issues, and that's why number three, I really think, is, is the big one, as opposed to, oh, en passant, uh, you know, the heart is, has reversed remodeling after you do a, a revascularization procedure. So somebody who's otherwise stable, that's really not the big question, and most people would just look for ischemia and just you do whatever is needed. So the indicators of viability, number one, I mean, don't ignore that. If somebody has true angina, they have viability, unless you're looking at a different, you know, distribution of where the ischemic burden is. Lack of Q waves is important. Hypokinesis as opposed to akinesis by itself is you still have viability in that area. Contractile reserve, we'll talk about that with dobutamine. Radionuclide uptake. Right, and uh, Dr. Mamarian will talk about that. Inducible ischemia, I think, will be important because, again, this is that you're inducing ischemia and therefore you can have some recovery and function afterwards. And the last but not least is on CMR, you know, a, a, a minimal or, uh, you know, delayed enhancement of gadolinium. These are data from us here when Dr. Jong was with us from Korea looking at uh, not only but EKG, but I think that we had a cohort, a large cohort with, with viability, and we looked at it. And the important message here is, if you don't have any Q waves and somebody with heart failure and ischemic heart disease, so this is the triad, uh, the specificity of viability is pretty high. The converse is not true. If I see Q waves, it really doesn't tell me much about that, and I think that's, that's the message from an electrocardiographic point of view, and I think that's still important. Dobutamine. If you go through the literature, I think dobutamine has been investigated and very nicely investigated from this institution and many others and looking at how do you detect viability. And at first it tells you something that is paradoxical, if you will. So if you have somebody with sig significant coronary disease, conceivably with repetitive ischemia, why, if you give an inotropic agent, can you still have what's called contractile reserve? Because it is a bit unusual, right? Because you, you shouldn't have much reserve if you're already having some dysfunction in that area. Uh, but indeed, it happens. Actually, the ma vast majority of the time, it happens. At times, you, something you will see that you know, doesn't sound right, meaning that although I have coronary disease in that segment, I have continued improvement despite higher doses of dobutamine which tells you maybe something about pathophysiologic correlates. Anyway, uh, the protocol for dobutamine is to use lower doses so you could see how, you know, you're going to emphasize the lower doses. And the reason why is since you have coronary disease, you're going to induce ischemia. If you jump to the higher doses and the high stress, you may only see the ischemic worsening as opposed to the 
this improvement in function that worsens function down the line. So this is our protocol that we validated many years ago. And this is an example of a dobutamine echocardiogram uh, that you will see hopefully will play. Um, and you could see the improvement in function of this heart except in the inferior base where basically no contractile reserve occurs. And we looked at the titration curve actually, if you have improvement in function and then later worsening, there isn't a single dose that tells you when you would have that. And that's why in our quad screen, we use baseline. We use two low doses, uh, be it 5 and 10 or 5 and 7.5, that's what we've, uh, and then the max dobutamine. Because there isn't a single dose on the lower level where you're going to see the maximal contractile improvement of function before it starts deteriorating. So this is from Dr. Afridi, and this is 20... 22, 23 years ago, time flies. Imran Afridi, now is in Dallas, was our fellow. And this was really the, the, the paper that put, you know, dobutamine and its investigation on the map. And the reason for it is we didn't only use low dose. We used low dose and high dose to try to look at these responses. Biphasic response is the one that's called improvement in function at lower dose and then worsening. No change. 35% of these segments had no change whatsoever. Echinesis, state echinesis. Sustained improvement, just like you saw in that case that I showed you. You can have improvement, and even at 40 mics, you have continued improvement, meaning no ischemia despite dysfunction at baseline, although you may have coronary disease, meaning you're at, at that level, you're not even inducing ischemia, which by itself you would then start suspecting, if I'm not inducing ischemia, if I revascularize this segment, the segment is now going to improve down the line because ischemia is not part, part of the pathophysiology. And some of them have no reserve whatsoever, which is worsening. And this is the predictive value of, of recovery of function depending on what kind of response do you see with dobutamine. Biphasic, higher predict, positive predictive value of recovery of function. Worsening, a little less, no change, and the others are a matter of doc, 10 to 15 percent. Yes, you may still have some, but this is part of the interpretation, part of the changes in pathophysiology. So the most important thing for you is if I want to use a dobutamine, I will emphasize the lower as well as the higher doses, but if you're concerned about safety, you can just stop at the lower doses and see whether there is some improvement, some contractile reserve in these situations. Biphasic response, much more specific, less sensitive. If you put in also any improvement in addition to biphasic response, therefore you're going to have more sensitivity, maybe lesser specificity. Now, all these are qualitative interpretations. And you say to yourself, well, is there something a little more objective? Is there something quantitative that we could use? And people have used strain imaging. And, you know, this is an example of you could see where the akinesis or dyskinesis is as opposed to the best segment, which is the lateral wall in blue. Uh, so, yes, you could use quantitation. People have validated that. Are they using it in uh, real time in laboratories? Most people have not. And I'm not going to belabor the point here. But to tell you that some quantitation adds something, and this is from Tom Marwick's group when he was in uh, Australia, I think, at that time. Uh, if you look at augmentation of almost, and so this is visual interpretation, the highest odds ratio. Yes, you can add strain or change in strain rate with dobutamine and add something to it, but certainly not as significant as what you're going to see in your eye most of the time. And that's why people have stuck with qualitative interpretation. So that's dobutamine. What I'm going to do in the next few slides is go through what else do you look on the echocardiogram to maybe help you, maybe help refine and have a, an overall interpretation of is this myocardium still viable, yes or no. We talk about myocardial thickness and thinning of the myocardium. And, you know, when we go with the fellows said, hmm, look how thin this myocardium compared to the other areas of thickness. Uh, this is an important one because that's part of remodeling and that's part of healing of the heart in somebody who has ischemic heart disease. It is still important, and, uh, but uh, Deepen will show you some interesting data in, this, in the minority of individuals. So the hypothesis here is that if I have a thin myocardium, and thin is like 5 millimeter, 6 millimeter, as opposed to the usual 8 and above millimeter, that you've had an infarct in that area, most likely it's completed, not much viability in it. And these are data from us. This is from Dr. Schweig when she was with us, again, few, quite a few years ago. Uh, 
from Brazil. And uh, on the left is wall motion and, and uh, wall thickness. So if you have a normal, uh, you know, resting wall motion, you'll have a normal thickness. And then with akinesis and dyskinesis and severe hypokinesis, the thickness of this heart gets less and less and less. And these are the same patients who had rest redistribution thallium, the same kind of phenomenon that you see, lesser uptake and therefore lesser viability. And actually, if you do an, a, uh, an AUC curve, uh, the 60% cutoff, and I know John will talk about that, is, is about six millimeter, right? So that's the threshold. So that the negative predictive value of, of viability, meaning it's not viable, is pretty high. It's not 100%, but it's pretty high. However, actually, there are data that from MRI telling us that there are situations where the heart is very thin, incredibly remodeled, very thin, but still without a scar that Deepen will show you. I think these are beautiful data from him and Ray Kim. So for us, if you're doing an edobutamine echocardiogram, you take a look at the heart at rest, look at areas of thickness, and then, you know, actually if you combine the butamine stress echo with thickness, you know, your, your predictive value increases. A few things about perfusion, and that I think took about, I would say, almost 10 years of investigations, and quite a few of them are from here, quite a few others from Sanjeev Call and, and other people. We're not using it as much because, again, there are so many, you know, so many situations nowadays that you use, but I think the concept is interesting because if you use contrast and now here at a lower dose of myocardial of, uh, perf uh, of index, uh, so you're not destroying these, these uh, you know, uh, contrast uh, bubbles, what you do is you do destruction replenishment. So you, you send a high MI, you destroy these bubbles, and you see the replenishment curves, and that's what you see there in these replenishment curves. So you start gating, and you see how much contrast is coming in, basically looking at myocardial blood flow in those areas. And you know the areas of, of hibernation are between the normals and between the completely scar. So yes, you could use it. And then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to belabor the point that MCE, which is myocardial contrast echo, behaves almost similarly to any perfusion techniques, rest redistribution without, without any stress. So yes, myocardial perfusion is important. And why would contrast, which is inert, it doesn't get uptaken by, by the myocardial cells as opposed to nuclear techniques where you have to invoke you know, properties of the cell membrane of the myocardial cells, is that with destruction, with destruction of the viable myocardium also comes, and we've demonstrated that, lesser and lesser capillaries. So here you're looking at the capillary, not only the myocardial blood flow, but also how much of the capillaries are there. And that's why contrast, with, <coughs> it's not interacting with anything else, it's rather inert, but it's just the myocardial blood volume is less because the capillaries are much less. And last but not least, is diastolic function. We don't use it as much, but I think it's interesting because this is an investigation from us, Dr. Young, when he was here a few years ago. We looked at diastolic function, just diastolic function. Look at the pattern of filling, knowing that diastolic function also is influenced by so many things, right? Filling pressures, many other things of the properties of the heart. But the bottom line here is that actually if you have what looks like slow relaxation, pattern as opposed to a restrictive pattern on the right. And you can correlate it to biopsies from these patients. And this was a, a spin-off uh, study, if you will, as opposed to the major reason to do the study. If you look at the contractile reserve versus this deceleration time, the more of this longer deceleration time or a slow relaxation pattern, it relates one way or another to, to uh, viability. So you could use that, and that's at rest without so if, I, if you tell me, what do I look at in, a, in an echocardiogram at rest alone, I would look at if there is quite a bit of thinning of the myocardium and at times echogenicity, I can look at the filling pattern of this heart because that filling pattern also tells us about how much fibrosis there is, contractile reserve. Also, you know, what's the prognosis like? What's the ICU stay, uh, admissions for heart failure, death or transplantation also tells us how well they're going to do down the line. So 
This is the current status with echocardiography, and the field really has not changed much from where most of these investigations have stopped, and I would say they have stopped about uh, maybe eight years ago or something like this. Uh, I mean, you see a lot of review of the literature now, but you tell me, where are the newer investigations? People have looked at genetically what, are, what is turned on from a, from a gene profile at the, the level, but nothing that is clinically applicable. Contractile reserve is good. You can take a look at that. Uh, ischemic uh, induction, you know, if you have ischemia, if you have angina symptoms, yes, it's important. Thickness is important to take a look at, as well as contrast and diastolic function. So I'm going to stop here and ask who's going to go next. Uh, John? Okay. I'll ask John, uh, Dr. Mamarian, to uh, give us an update on where we are in nuclear techniques in these evaluations. John? All right, so we're going to just spend a few minutes talking about uh, myocardial perfusion imaging and uh, both SPECT and PET in terms of looking at viability issues. And um, I just want to make some important points in terms of our endpoints when we look at uh, viability because there are pathologic uh, endpoints in terms of looking at whole hearts, for instance, looking at um, the amount of fibrosis and the amount of viable myocardium in terms of myocytes that are present. And then there are clinical correlates in terms of improvement in regional function, uh, reduction in ischemic uh, jeopardized myocardium, improvement in global ejection fraction and regional ejection fraction, improvement in symptom status, improvement in exercise capacity, reverse remodeling and improved outcomes. So there's a lot of different ways in which we can look at what our endpoint should be when we think about how we're using our techniques to look at viability. Now this is just one example of, of looking at uh, endpoints. This is, these are two different studies that we're looking at, at baseline ejection fraction and looking at improvement in ejection fraction after revascularization. And I think what you can appreciate here is that in many of these patients, uh, patients had either no improvement some improvement or actually went down uh, after getting revascularized. And so this is one of the strong points in why uh, looking at viability is important because if you just take the routine patient with a low ejection fraction, only about a third will actually improve their overall function. If we look at overall outcome, it's also important. This is uh, data from, from Allman several years ago. Uh, and this was actually using nuclear data as well as echo data. And what you can see here is that if you have viable myocardium and you get revascularized, you do, a, you do, you do much better than if you get medical therapy, okay? Now, granted, you might debate what the intensity of medical therapy was and all the rest. This was many years ago, you know, 15 years ago. But still, if you look at the overall groups, if you're viable, you do better with getting blood flow down to the coronary arteries with revascularization than you do with medical therapy. On the converse, if you're non-viable, it doesn't appear that bypass surgery really affected mortality all that much. So in general, we try to err on the side of viability in terms of finding those patients who might benefit rather than negating necessarily, oh, they, they're not viable and therefore they, they're not, they're not going to really uh, improve. When we look at uh, nuclear cardiac imaging, we have to think about what we're imaging, okay? So when we look at just rest injections, we're looking at blood flow, uptake that is flow dependent. And it's one of the whole basis behind using thallium imaging because no matter what tracer you give initially, it will all be flow dependent. And then with the case of thallium, you actually get eking of the tracer back into underperfused areas. So you look for redistribution. What's also important is the issue of cell membrane, main, uh, cell membrane integrity because if you don't have an intact cell, thallium will not be taken up. So if the cell, main, cell, membrane is, cell membrane is destroyed, you don't get uptake of thallium. Likewise, with technesium-based products, if you have mitochondrial, uh, if you lack mitochondrial integrity, you will not uptake the technesium. So it'll just pass through the heart and not be taken up. So these are all ways in which if you have uptake, you have some viability, always, okay? It just depends on the amount of uptake you have. And of course, when we look at other techniques such as FDG PET, we're looking at glucose uptake, which is, which is um, what a starving myocardium utilizes uh, to, uh, to uh, maintain energy. Uh, and of course, PET imaging is, is, is a very important technique in this regard. 
When we look at thallium uh, protocols, we look at rest redistribution thallium. We also do stress because stress, if you can do stress and show evidence of ischemia, you can improve your ability to determine who might improve their overall function. So we think ischemia imaging is also very important. We do stress redistribution reinjection imaging. I'll show you some of that. We do a lot of nitrate enhanced imaging because that nitrates improve subendocardial blood flow and they help improve blood flow to those underperfused areas. Technesium protocols, stress rest, stress rest, nitrate enhanced, and also rest imaging alone with or without nitrates. And then of course combined protocols. This is just an example of where nitrates are, are, can be shown to be very important, where ischemia is important. This is a patient who had a large ischemic burden, stress rest, was shown to have disease only in a, in a, in a uh, uh, septal perforator and got extensive nitrate treatment only and showed a complete normalization of the study. So nitrates help improve our ability to identify viable tissue and we use them as part of our uh, uh, imaging modalities. Let's look at thallium uptake. And, and remember, you have to understand that, bef that most of this data comes in terms of rest studies because in the old days, we couldn't put heart failure patients on a treadmill. I mean, they were already profoundly sick, they were short of breath, et cetera. So we had to use some resting techniques, okay? So rest thallium imaging was one of those techniques. You will see that there's a spectrum in terms of where there's no viability, where you have basically very little of any uptake of the tracer, and where you increasingly get more and more likelihood of detecting viability as the amount of tracer uh, uh, concentration increases. And so as Dr. Zygwe was telling you, once you get above 50 or 60% of normal tracer activity, then you are more likely to be able to say that is viable tissue and, and it would be unlikely that tissue would not be viable. But again, it's gonna be a spectrum, and it's a spectrum in all of these techniques, including MRI, in terms of looking at the thickness of the myocardium that, uh, that is affected as, uh, with SCAR. This is looking at a similar uh, distribution in terms of a spectrum. If you look at all the different studies that have been performed over the years, there are 40 studies using thallium to predict improvement in regional function, and five studies using thallium to predict global, fun global improvement in function. And what you'll see is pretty much the same thing in both series. You'll see about 80 to 90% sensitivity, but notice the low specificity, okay? And this is one of the advantages of some other techniques, particularly echocardiography, in terms of identifying those, those areas that clearly are not viable, okay, as compared to what is viable. But in terms of perfusion imaging, highly sensitive, not very specific. If you look at the addition of nitrates, this is now a study we published many years ago in 1997 where we actually took patients, exercised them, did exercise spec, they had stress imaging, they had redistribution imaging with thallium, and then they got reinjection with nitro or didn't. So it was, it was, a, it was a, 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 a randomized group. And what you'll notice is that in this area, you'll see this is an example where there's a big perfusion abnormality really very little redistribution, and with nitrate-enhanced reinjection of marked improvement in terms of identifying viable tissue. So in this study, 33% of the patients uh, on placebo had, had some improvement, but 58% with nitrates, of, and that's one of the reasons why we use nitro routinely when we try to look at viable tissue. Just as I showed you with thallium in terms of uptake, this has also been shown with technesium. And again, this is looking at pathology specimens. This is when we took actually patients to, uh, to the, when they were going for revascularization, we took samples of the myocardium in those areas that were revascularized and thought to be to viable. And what you can see is that the, that the uh, amount of activity was again predictive of whether the extent of viability in the myocardium in terms of the number of myocytes versus fibrosis. So again, this is the spectrum. And although we use this 50, 60% cutoff as a, as a cut point, you have to re remember that there is a tremendous spectrum in terms of, of uh, and gradation here in terms of what's viable and non-viable. Same thing as with thallium, you can see with technesium, you have about 80 to 90% sensitivity. Again, a little bit better specificity, particularly when you use nitrates, but again, less than what you see with echocardiography in terms of specificity. This is an example of nitrate-enhanced technesium uh, uh, improvement. Uh, 
This is rest imaging. You can see the control here with a marked perfusion abnormality. And then after administration of nitro and reinjection, you can see a marked improvement in, uh, in uptake. So again, the importance of nitrates. And in this particular study, they actually looked at outcome. And you can see without using nitrates, there was really no way to look at who was going to get better and who was not in terms of outcome. But with nitrate enhanced, if someone had nitrate in, no nitrate enhanced viability, and remember, these, this, was a, this was a series where people didn't get revascularized. They did actually quite well. But in those who had viability and were just treated with medical therapy, they did poorly. So again, this idea of being able to distinguish nitro, nitro uh, uh, with nitrates, whether tissue is viable or non-viable. PET is another way. We look for PET mismatches. So what we do is we look for uh, uptake of, uh, of FTG, okay, and lack of uptake with perfusion. So this is ammonia where there's lack of perfusion, but where there's still residual glucose uptake, indicating that the cells are alive and still utilizing glucose as a substrate. So PET imaging has been obviously a, one, of the, one of the best techniques to look at myocardial viability over the years. And in fact, when you look at how PET can, out, can determine outcome, if you look at PET studies over the years, you can see that by using PET to guide therapy, you can determine who does better with revascularization as compared to who does better with medical therapy. There's a lot of data also in terms of looking at regional improvement of, of LV function. And as you can see here, that most of the techniques have very high sensitivity. And uh, again, this is echocardiography, a little bit less sensitivity than the other techniques, but improved specificity, OK? When you look at global improvement in function, again, that's, that's, very, that's very diverse in terms of 80 to 90% sensitivity with a little bit of improvement in specificity uh, with echocardiography. What affects specificity? This is an important point because it really depends on the outcome that you're looking at. So if you're looking for improvement in ejection fraction, the waiting time before revascularization, the, the, uh, the ischemic event that occurred, Incomplete revascularization, if you have incomplete revascularization, you may not get an improvement in ejection fraction, even though the tissue is viable. Graft occlusion, post-revascularization, timing of the second assessment. You have to give the myocardium time to improve, so that's a very important. Extent of viable myocardium. Dr. Zogby mentioned if you have one myocyte that's viable, it's not going to help you. You need to have a large area that's viable to be able to see those kind of improvements. Extent of adjacent subendocardial scar and obviously LV dilation. Looking at the size of the defect, if you, this is data from George Beller's laboratory many years ago. If you had more than seven segments viable, patients improved their ejection fraction. Less than seg seven segments viable, they didn't. So size matters. This was also shown, uh, this is Jerome Back's data, looking at extent viability. As you have greater and greater number of viable segments, you have a much greater likelihood of improving ejection fraction. End systolic volume, as the end systolic volume gets larger and larger, you have less likelihood, even if it's viable, to see improvement in the overall, uh, overall EF. And uh, this is a meta-analysis that was looked at both PET, stress echo, and also SPEC. And I want you to notice that if you look at these studies in terms of in patients with viability, whether it was PET, whether it was echo, or whether it was SPEC, Patients did better with revascularization than they did with medical therapy. Conversely, if you look at a, the same meta-analysis in patients who didn't have viability using any of these three techniques, there was no change in outcome. Okay? So again, it shows you that by identifying viable tissue, irrespective of the technique, you will be doing your, your, uh, your patients a benefit. Last but not least, this is a study that was... Uh, published uh, several years ago where it was a randomized trial where either PET was used to identify patients who should get revascularized or shouldn't versus just routine care. And what you will see here is that in the PET-driven arm, patients did much better long-term in terms of their survival as compared to the standard of care. And this was particularly, this was particularly in this group called the Ottawa Five where the PET imaging was absolutely used as criteria for 
no crossover. Either if they were viable, they got revascularized. If they weren't viable, they didn't. In, in some of the other centers, there was crossover or, or not a, adherence to protocol. And if you could look at the Ottawa 5 group, that, again, that was shown dramatically, that if you use PET in viable patients and revascularized them, they did great as compared to if they didn't have viability, they did much poorer. So PET actually is this one of the first randomized studies to really look at the value of imaging and PET imaging in this regard, FTG PET, to look at those issues. So to conclude in this area, SPECT, we obviously do a lot of different protocols. We like to use some form of stressor to look for ischemia as well as viable tissue when we do our studies. And this can be done with, with either um, thallium or it can be done with uh, nitrate enhanced techniques using technesium. And of course, PET still remains the gold standard in nuclear cardiac imaging in terms of identifying viability. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got kind of a whirlwind tour through different modalities here today. So we're gonna finish off um, with a talk about the role of cardiac MRI in assessment of myocardial viability, and then hopefully we'll have some time for uh, uh, some group discussion and questions at the very end. So I think John's already touched on this, which is, you know, what is the definition of viability? And I think it's important to keep in mind that we have surrogate definitions that we use, but re in reality, the true definition is probably the presence of living monocyte is viable, and the absence of living monocyte is non-viability. So how does CMR work? So let me show you uh, kind of the original uh, publication, and this is an animal model published uh, in 1999, so within the last 20 years, showing how the delayed enhancement CMR technique works. So in this case, LAD was ligated, uh, and then the histopathology is ultimately shown in an animal model on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, does this work? Okay, on the right-hand side is your CMR images. And what you'll notice is that there's this uh, close relationship between what you see on the CMR and what you see by histopathology slice by slice. And in fact, if you take a look at one of these views and blow it up, you can see that what you see at histopathology is almost a direct match to what you would see by CMR. So we've got a technique now which allows you in living human beings to be able to directly visualize not just the presence of infarct, but in fact the morphology uh, of the infarct itself. Now in this original study, what was the relationship between the size of the infarct by histology and the size of the infarct by MRI? And you can see it's a very tight relationship. And, and for this uh, particular p publication, experiments were done both at one day, at three days, and even at eight weeks after the infarct. So what this showed us at least is that in the setting of acute infarct, in an animal model, what you see as hyperenhancement very closely correlates with what you actually will find at histopathology. So next now, let's talk about how do we do this in humans, in patients. So it requires a peripheral IV, patient has to go into the scanner. We typically are gonna acquire a set of city images which allow us to look at contractile function uh, and chamber size. We'll then inject gadolinium contrast, wait about five or 10 minutes, and then perform are delayed enhancement MRI images. So you'll notice there's no stress agent required uh, to, perf to perform this technique. And here's some examples of uh, patients with known myocardial infarction that underwent imaging with CMR anywhere from six, you know, about seven months, six months to almost a year after their acute infarct presentation. And what you'll notice in this example patient on the left-hand side who had a known infarct-related artery of the LED is that you have an area of hyperenhancement here in the anterior wall. On the right-hand side, you have a patient who had a known infarct in the RCA territory, and in this patient, you have an area of hyperenhancement along the inferior wall, which corresponds, again, to RCA territory. Now, what's unique here, though, is not only can we identify that there's presence of infarct, but you can actually quantitate the extent of the infarct. And so in this particular example, in these anterior wall segments, the infarct is almost transmural, meaning there's almost 100% infarct of those segments. On the uh, middle example here, the 
The infarct only involves about 50% of the wall thickness because half of the, the wall is, is bright and the other outer half of the wall is dark. And on the right-hand side, you've got an example of a patient who really has very limited infarct, less than 25% of the thickness of the wall. So the reason that we're able to do this, again, is because the resolution of this technique is very high. The pixel sizes are on the order of about one and a half millimeters. So therefore, for a 10 millimeter thick wall, you're able to quantitate the extent of the infarct beyond just the presence or absence, but rather quantify it by the, the amount of the wall thickness in any given area. Uh, and as a result of this higher resolution, uh, in this uh, publication, they're also able to identify very small infarcts. In fact, this is a patient who had a CK of 513 with a CKMB of only 62. And in this middle example here, patient with an RCA infarct two months ago uh, with a peak MB rise of only 12, you're able to identify an area of hyperenhancement, again, corresponding to that uh, distribution. So again, as I talked about the high spatial resolution, uh, and the high contrast noise. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the signal intensity within your normal myocardium, which is black, compare that to the signal intensity within your infarct, you have almost a five-fold increase in signal intensity. And then lastly, this can be done, obviously, without the need for radiation exposure. Now, uh, you know, identifying infarcts is, is interesting, but I think what many would say is, what we really want to know is can we use this information to help uh, predict which patients are likely to have the greatest magnitude of improvement in contractility, and then ultimately to try to identify which patients are going to be uh, the ones that benefit most from revascularization versus those that need to go on for uh, more aggressive, advanced uh, heart failure therapies. The idea of looking beyond functional improvement. So uh, to look at the idea of, of CMR predicting functional improvement, uh, this, we go back now to the classic publication in New England Journal in 2000 where they took a series of patients that uh, had coronary disease, were scheduled for coronary bypass or percutaneous bypass, uh, percutaneous revascularization, and underwent uh, CINE and delayed enhancement MRI on all these patients beforehand. These patients then went on to get their revascularization and then were brought back about three months later for repeat CINE assessment to see if the findings on the initial delayed enhancement could predict likelihood of improvement after revascularization. So here's an example uh, of one particular case. Uh, and you can see in this patient here, you have LV dysfunction, which manifests as regional variation. In fact, the inferior wall almost looks like it's akinetic. Uh, all segments have some level of dysfunction, but some are worse than others. Now, and the mean EF for the, or the uh, ejection fraction for this individual was 30%. Uh, the delayed enhancement MRI finds actually several interesting findings. One is if you look at the uh, anterior wall, you've got a pretty significant amount of infarction uh, along the anterior wall, incorporating probably more than 75% of the thickness of the wall. But the septum and the lateral wall are black, showing no infarction. And then for the inferior wall also, you've got uh, some level of infarction. We'd probably call this in the 50% range or so. And in this patient, you'll notice after revascularization that one, the overall ejection fraction improved from 30% to 45%. And you'll, if you look at the septal walls and the lateral walls, you'll notice that those are the two areas that seem to improve the greatest, whereas the anterior wall and the inferior wall, where we saw evidence of hyperenhancement, did not show uh, the same magnitude of improvement. Um, and in fact, in this New England Journal publication, uh, when they identified segments based on the amount of enhancement within the segment prior to revascularization, there was a, a pretty nice relationship between the amount of enhancement and the likelihood of improvement in contractile function, such that for those segments or for those regions that showed no hyperenhancement at all, the likelihood of improvement was fairly high, more than 80%. And then on the flip side, for those segments that showed more than 75% hyperenhancement, the likelihood of improvement was very low, essentially close to zero. And then you have this inverse relationship with uh, intermediate grades of uh, hyperenhancement. Now we'll come back to this uh, concept in a second uh, at the very end of this talk. But the other thing I want to point out here also 
was when they looked at those segments that had the most dysfunction, so only looking at akinetic or dyskinetic segments, in fact, both the positive as well as the negative predictive values actually got stronger. And so I think that's another strength of the technique is that it seems to function well irrespective of the magnitude of baseline dysfunction that you're dealing with. And then from a global standpoint, there's a relationship between the extent of the left ventricle that's dysfunctional but viable and the overall change in ejection fraction. And you can see, in fact, that um, if we were to use a threshold of about 5% increase in LV ejection fraction to, to define a global improvement, that would correspond along this regression line to about 25% of the left ventricle that's dysfunctional but viable. Um, and then, uh, lastly, it's important to keep in mind that, that traditionally we think about viability in patients that we're thinking about sending on for revascularization, but in fact, viability uh, may also predict likelihood of improvement uh, in the setting of stun myocardium. And so this middle bar here uh, was from a couple of studies that looked at patients that presented with acute coronary uh, disease, so acute infarction. And again, you see the same inverse relationship that as the extent of hyperenhancement increases, the likelihood of improvement after primary PCI goes down. Uh, and furthermore, even in patients that are not revascularization candidates, that are just getting medical therapy uh, with chronic heart failure and LV dysfunction, you can see that the likelihood of improvement is inversely related to the extent of hyperenhancement within any given segment. Now, obviously, you will notice that medical therapy is not as robust as revascularization therapy, whether it be in the acute setting or in the chronic setting. But again, this relationship of viability and predicting functional improvement seems to hold true both for medical therapy as well as for revascularization. Now, the, the next question. The, the last one, interestingly, is the positive predictive value is much lower. And you wonder about remodeling of this heart. Right. Well, so, and, and also, this is just medical therapy alone. These are not, this is not revascularization. So what this tells us is that revascularization therapies are more robust than just beta blocker therapy alone. And then, you know, last you may say, well, so how is it that, that th this MRI technique is able to identify my, uh, myocardial infarction or scarring in a variety of different settings? Because if you think about it, histologically, uh, an acute infarct is actually very different than a chronic scar. Uh, but the unifying theme seems to be as follows. Uh, if you look at normal myocardium, you have nice, tightly packed myocytes with intact cell membranes. There's really very little room for distribution of gadolinium, which is an extracellular agent. Gadolinium doesn't go into the cells. There's very little extracellular space. Therefore, in any given pixel of normal myocardium, there's very little gadolinium uptake. In the setting of an acute infarct, now you've got rupture of these cell membranes, which happens acutely. And as a result, gadolinium now is able to distribute not only extracellularly, but also within these ruptured cells. And, and as a result, there's more gadolinium uptake within any given uh, uh, cell or any given segment. And then in the setting of uh, chronic scar, where you have a collagen matrix, again, now you have this loose matrix of collagen, but you've got now an increase in extracellular space. And as a result, more room for gadolinium to distribute. Uh, and so therefore, in both of these example cases, whether it's due to an acute infarct with ruptured cell membranes or chronic uh, scar with replacement with collagen, uh, you see hyperenhancement present. Now, let me uh, touch on just kind of a couple of uh, uh, subgroups of patients that I think are interesting. And one group, obviously, is those patients who have LV wall thinning. So here's an example of a patient who has fairly extensive wall thinning uh, and who has extensive infarction within that uh, thin wall. And then uh, in this case, if you look uh, at a separate case now, here's another case who also has fairly significant wall thinning in the anterior wall and apex. The wall here measures about four and a half millimeters, and the LV ejection fraction here is depressed at about 30%. But what's interesting is when you do your delayed enhancement MRI, Although the amount of black viable myocardium is, is reduced as well, the amount of bright or scar is very little. So this is an example where we would say there's extensive wall thinning, but in fact really limited amount of myocardial scar. And as you can see on this zoomed view here, the amount of scar hyperenhancement actually is less than the amount of black or viable myocardium. And so in this example case, 
Um, despite the fact that you have a wall that's, that's significantly thinned, uh, because of the fact there's very limited scar present in this wall, we would hypothesize that this wall would actually be viable and would improve contractility. And in fact, in this particular example case, what you notice after revascularization of the LED is that wall thickness now, in fact, has uh, improved and contractility has improved, and overall ejection fraction has gone from 30% now to 50%, and this was uh, three months after uh, surgical revascularization. Now, so, you know, on the, you know, that's one example case from a series of, of uh, uh, patients that we looked at, and this was over 200 patients with evidence of wall thinning, and what we found was, in fact, uh, of those that went on to get revascularized, there's this inverse relationship between the amount of scar within the thinned area and the likelihood of uh, change in systolic wall thickening, meaning improvement in contractility, uh, such that for those segments or those regions that showed, or those patients, I should say, that showed very little scar within the thinned area, they had a pretty significant improvement in systolic wall thickening, whereas for those patients who had a significant amount of scarring within the thinned area, they did not. And in fact, when we stratify these using a 50% cutoff, uh, patients with less than 50% scarring within the thinned area uh, almost uniformly showed an improvement in systolic wall thickening after revascularization, whereas when there was more than 50% scar within the thinned area, uh, really there was no improvement in contractile function within the thin region. And then I think what was more striking, in fact, was if you look at wall thickness, there's actually a recovery of, of the wall thinning. So that uh, in those patients who had less than 50% scarring, the wall thickness in end diastole actually increased after revascularization, whereas for those patients who had significant scarring more than 50%, wall thickness remained unchanged after revascularization. Now, how often did this phenomenon occur? And so in, in our cohort of patients that we looked at, uh, this phenomenon of limited scarring despite wall thinning seemed to occur in about 18% of patients. Uh, and in fact, you found you know, a few percent that despite wall thinning had really uh, very little, you know, less than 25% scar, and the vast majority had between 26 and 50% scar. Um, but again, so you can think of it as, as four out of five patients with wall thinning are gonna have extensive scar, but maybe as much as one in five may in fact have a uh, very limited scar. Uh, and then these are patients that may uh, demonstrate improvement in contractility and wall thickness with revascularization. Now, last things I want to touch on, and I think John already touched on this, which is that although we use functional improvement as kind of our surrogate for truth, uh, keep in mind that there's a lot of uh, different reasons why you may not see functional improvement uh, beyond the fact that a region is not viable. Uh, it has to do with the fact that if there's not complete revascularization, if there's recurrent events that occur, in other words, the patient has another MI in the perioperative period, uh, you know, what's the optimal timing to do follow-up imaging? Uh, you know, maybe if you do imaging later and later after the revascularization, you may see some improvement in contractility. Also keep in mind that even if you have an area that is viable, that's been revascularized, that's trying to improve contractility, if it's tethered down by other areas adjacent to it that are not working, it may not be able to manifest improvement. And then the other important thing to keep in mind is that myocardial dysfunction may not in fact be due to coronary hypoperfusion to begin with. Um, and so this is an area where potentially doing ischemia provocation testing may be helpful to truly identify an area that's not only dysfunctional and viable, but also ischemic or hypoperfused. Um, and I think the last thing to keep in mind, though, I think is that although we like to look for, uh, when we talk about sensitivity and specificity, is a dichotomous phenomenon. Uh, and that would be fine if the relationship between viability and likelihood of improvement look like this, where there was a very sharp cutoff, that as you have more viability, once you get to some threshold, all of a sudden you, you get a, a significant improvement. But the underlying physiology of viability itself may be much more like this, where if you have 60% viability, you probably are gonna do better than if you have 50% versus 40% versus 30%. It may be much more of a linear relationship. And therefore, anytime we try to do uh, any kind of analyses where we're trying to just simply dichotomize, improve, not improve, viable, not viable, that there may be issues with that. And then lastly, you know, we've, we've uh, I think all of us have talked previously about the STITCH trial. Uh, I think uh, John and, and Bill very nicely showed uh, 
outcomes data with nuclear-based techniques and with echo-based techniques. And I'll just leave you with this one uh, uh, outcomes-based study. This was, again, a small group, 150 patients uh, out of Europe, where they looked at uh, CMR and late gallium enhancement and its relationship to uh, survival and, and uh, uh, likelihood of improvement. And what they found in this analysis, again, was that for those patients who had, by CMR, evidence of viability, uh, revascularization seemed to uh, result in a better outcome than for those patients who did not have viability, uh, in which case uh, medical therapy or revascularization crossed the line of one, suggesting that there's not a clear consensus. So again, limitations with this, just like all of the other uh, studies that we've, that we've done, that are, aside from STITCH, are these are non-randomized, these are observational studies. And again, it always brings you to the question of, if somebody has significant viability, but a surgeon does not want to operate on this person, nobody wants to revascularize this person, there may be selection biases that are coming at, at play. So again, I think you know, this, this whole, you know, for me it's interesting because I've been studying this field for the last 15 years. Uh, you know, some of these folks here have been studying it even longer than that. And, 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 and our, concepts, our concepts in viability, I think, are continuing to change. But I think we, don't, we, we still don't have a complete uh, understanding of uh, how to interpret viability assessment, I think. Okay, thank you for your attention. And let's get everybody to come on up. And we'll start off with Dr. Q. There are a couple of points for the fellows. First of all, the quality of what you've heard is as good or superior to what you're getting in any major meeting. So you guys really are spoiled. Um, second thing, a couple of practical points. Echo, nuclear, and you saw now also by CMR, all three have shown that 25% threshold. Exactly. You have more than 25% of viability by whatever technique, perfect or imperfect as they are, your chances for EF improvement is much better. And deep, and you're right, that linear relation exactly is what we, everybody has shown. It's a linear relation between percent viability on a global basis and a gradual further improvement in EF. So I think you're correct in that linear concept. Um, the other point is, is that. that, that 20 to 25 percent has been demonstrated by ECHO for wild motion, although the thresholds right? are a little different. But at least you need more than 15 percent. Yes. The myocardium to demonstrate that. The question we don't know is what is the threshold? for heart failure symptomatology. Right. We know what the EF, but we don't know for heart for failure For a clinic, because most people have published on, on our objective EF rather than follow picture patients. Right. Another important point is, and one of Dr. Zogby's first papers on viability showed that very nicely is, we almost all of everybody imaging technique has used a resting EF as your goal, as your marker of improvement. Six months later, four months later, whatever. But Bill showed very nicely that actually dobutamine EF after revascularization is dramatic. So you may have a patient, and we see this clinically, got revascularized, patient feels better, they're happy, you do a global assessment, ah, EF may, maybe had a mediocre change. Dobutamine, four, six months later, and he said, like, wow. So from a practical point of view, you may periodically, in the right patients, you may actually want to do a dobutamine stress four to six months later, because that may really show you a bigger impact than what that resting EF, and, and Bill showed that very nicely in one of the early papers. Because that's ultimately what patients care about, one way or another. Right. What do they do now they care themselves, mm -hmm. and how much reserve do they have? So. Other, other questions from the fellows? For, for this, you need to know ventricular function, regional function probably, just to know if it is, right? You need to know the anatomy. We're not talking about here. I just want to know what the heart looks like. And see testing. You have to kind of put the whole picture together to decide, right? Uh, about viability and what you could do about it because the same things can happen for a cardiomyopathic relationship. And not area of dysfunction of the myocardium is supplied by an epicardial artery. And part of this reason is the heart may remodel totally while the burden is most likely maybe in the LED ter territory and all the other territories are supplied by 
at least epicardially, normal arteries. So you need to know the anatomy on top of function and various testing. And you don't have to necessarily stack, you know, not everybody has to get an MRI, although this is really the gold standard nowadays. But if you have somebody with a, with a bad heart that you already did a stress test on, and you have a lot of ischemia, you don't need further testing. <laughs> because ischemia is a marker already. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask about microvascular <coughs> disease and coronary flow reserve. Is the evaluation of any of these or you know, the rest of the vasculature of any importance in assessing viability? Or is that nothing that has been really studied? I mean, it's interesting, uh, uh, yeah. John, you may want to answer, but uh, in the early studies, uh, some of these uh, coronary flow reserve, if you will, actually was a study from, from here looking at, after the myocardial infarction, looking at fractional flow reserve and, and what's the flow reserve in the distribution of that previous infarction that relates actually to the amount of viability because also it's the density of the capillaries in addition to the myocardial function that is important, right? Because they go hand in hand as to viability. And so you may have some of that. Yeah. So, so there, are, there are limited data. I mean, but there are data with coronary closure showing that irrespective of whether you have necessarily ischemia or not, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that if you have abnormal flow reserve, you actually do better, and if it's extensive, you do better with uh, revascularization than you do with medical therapy. So, so I think there the is... the burden of ischemia most likely is higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so there are data. There are but a very limited data with PET imaging at this point. And again, those are not necessarily people with depressed LV function. Those are people who have... A, who have you know, underlying ischemic heart disease, right? Not necessarily bad EFs. Right. <laughs> Anything <laughs> else? If not, thank you. That was great. Thank you very much.